Just a heads up, this is a conversation between adults about some adult topics, so use your judgment. I don't know if anyone's done three no filters before. You could be the first. You're well, that, the first. that's Welcome. because I give good potty. You do give good potty. Yeah, thank you. You do. <laughs> you know and why? We've, we've got good pod chem. Well, yeah, I've noticed. We weren't each other's type. She didn't like me. She loved me. I didn't like her. I loved her. From Mamma Mia, I'm Mia Friedman, and you're listening to No Filter, candid conversations that count. Nobody can push your buttons quite like a sibling can. And just because Samuel Johnson is the most high-profile sibling in Australia after he founded the charity Love Your Sister for his own sister, Connie, after she was diagnosed with breast cancer, that doesn't make their relationship any less complicated. Connie died just over a year ago, and it's been a brutal year for Sam in ways that you wouldn't expect, in ways that he didn't expect. This is the third time I've talked to Sam for No Filter, and he's one of my favourite people to interview. The word raw and authentic is probably overused, but those are two words that come to mind to describe Sam. He's just, he's an open book and sometimes he's an open wound and he's funny and he's irreverent and he's naughty and he's fierce and imperfect and messy and complicated. He's a clown and a warrior and he's a champion for every single person who has cancer. All these things sound so cliched, but he really is all of those things. And he's all of those things within seconds of each other. It's quite extraordinary to sit in front of him and just watch him feel everything so intensely and things come over his face. His eyes filled with tears sometimes when we talked. Other times you could see how angry he felt. And other times he just looked kind of really lost, which is very, very Sam. We've become good friends since our first interview and like most women, I'm kind of protective of Sam. This interview is really honest, probably the most honest one that I've done with him so far. And because of that, there'll be some people who will be challenged by what he says about his own life and about decisions he's made and about his relationship with Connie. But if you want the quick polished version of anyone's story, no Filter probably isn't the podcast for you. Here's Sam. How long has it been since Connie died? About 14, 15 months. And in the aftermath, there was a lot going on. Like something that you knew was going to happen for so many years happens. Then there's big outpouring of public grief. There's funerals, private funerals, public memorials. Even just the physicality of all the time you spent talking to her and, and being with her what fills that void and what do those months afterwards look like? Oh, drugs, alcohol, any excuse really. Mm. <laughs> I stayed up for 15 days after she died uh, oh. and you can't really do that naturally. Um, I had a public memorial to stage and I got it in my head that that was the most important role or job that I'd ever play. I had one hour to celebrate Connie and... I wanted it to be perfect. I did not want to celebrate her as a myth or as a, uh, you know, I didn't want to Jane McGrath her and turn her into an inspiration. I wanted to show anyone who didn't know her what, what she was really like. And that was where I started. And 15 days later, uh, I pulled together the most amazing thing I've ever uh, been in charge of. It, it, that service was, I mean, I, I don't care how fucked up I got during it, it worked. Um, that it was the service was impeccable. I watched it back at because we filmed it, and it, it's like Princess Di's funeral. It's like it's that it's that amazing to look at. And then there's just close ups on all me and my family, and I was able to watch it back and realize how much I'd missed. So yeah, I don't know. After as soon as she died, I, I, it was crazy. I like I got on the phone on some manic rant to Carl Stefanovic for ninety minutes. We've got to do this, we've got to do that, yeah, and we're doing this. And it was the rantings of a madman. I look back now and I'm like, wow, what were you? Where were you? So, yeah, I was pretty charged. I was doing whatever I could do to stay up. And I was burying myself in her, in, in the funeral, in this last show that I could do for Connie because I've always presented Connie for six years. This was my last chance to present her 
uh, in real life and not from the grave, but because that wasn't the from the grave bit yet. So I think putting together that funeral is almost one of the things I'm proudest of. What are your memories of that day? Oh, not many. I was tired. I, it was enough for me to get there. My memories are of watching it back. I had a great time I, yeah, at the funeral. I love funerals. They're so fun. Um, do you not? Oh, they're do way you better love than they're them? way better than weddings. Oh, way better. You have more fun because there's not What's that. What's the fun part at a funeral? There is actually a lot more humour at funerals than people expect. Oh, and, yeah. and when, like when you actually think about, almost every funeral I've been to has humour. Yeah. Because you have to laugh. And it's Australia. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's... It, 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 what were the funny parts of Connie's funeral? Um, the real bits. Yeah. Because Connie, cause Connie was a nightmare. She was an absolute nightmare. So it was good. It was good. But as soon as she died, I felt I could lift the lid. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know what? Yeah, she's an amazing sister. She's an amazing mum. She's a great advocate. But she's a pain in the ass. Check this out, you know. Um, and everyone got up there and really was respectful of my request not to deify her. And to talk about the person she wants, to celebrate who she was, not who she told the world she was, not who she told her family she was, not who, to, who she told herself she was, who she was. And I had 10 of the people closest to her who knew exactly who she was. Who spoke? Uh, everybody. Um, in fact, for the first time, the whole family came out. My, my other sister came out and spoke publicly for the first time. She's my, very my, interesting, that is, sister. Oh, she's, yeah, I'm the boring one. You really are. Yeah, I, know. I spoke to her on the phone. She was yeah. amazing. Yeah, she is. She um, is a prison officer. She is. Yeah, yeah. She And she's releasing her first novel next year. Um, our dad and mum were, uh, were, were, were writers. Um, and um, I have a little known half-brother that's... At the moment, choosing whether to kind of change the way the UN or the IMF works. Um, um, Which should it be? Yeah, I know. He's, how old is he? Uh, he's a lot younger than me. He's a, he's, he'd be about, I don't know how old, but he'd be probably about 27, 28. And he's just finishing off his master's. He's, he's just been in, invited to his PhD. Uh, and as soon as he's done with his studies, he'll, he'll change the way the world spends its money. He's a finance... Uh, guy, I don't even understand him when he talks. He's a genius, um, but I'm definitely the boring one. We got we got all the interesting ones up there, and they all came out and they all said the truth. I'd encourage anyone who's interested in knowing Connie at all to um, to look at Love Your Sister TV on YouTube and check out the funeral. It's an awesome show. It's one of the best funerals you'll see on YouTube. Um, <laughs> the day after the funeral, you wake up. Yep. Haven't slept for fifteen days. Yeah. Nothing to prepare. No media to do. Well, probably there's always media to do. No, no, that's, that comes in waves. What yeah. happens that next morning? Uh, well, to work. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've got a legacy to uphold. I've got, a, you know, I've got jobs that she left me with. And I love my work. So it just went from, sell it from basically upholding Connie's living legacy to upholding Connie's legacy. So. Did you and she talk about what would happen on the other side? Yeah, of her yeah, death. yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I mean, but not much because she couldn't handle the frustration of not being able to control it much. Um, so, yeah, she ended up um, focusing mostly on that which she she could control. But you know, it was great to get love your sister to myself after. I was going to say you suddenly did have to not ask anyone. Cause yeah, you... well, I never had to ask her anyway because I set this organisation up for her. So um, ultimately, she's not on the board, um, so and she never was. Um, so I made sure she couldn't. Um, Why? She, that she couldn't um, tell me how to do the work um, because I knew how to do it better. Could she offer nothing? She offered plenty. But one thing you don't need with a power broker like Connie is her handles on the organisation. I'm the best person to raise $10 million, not her. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm the best person to take her story to the country. I had 15 years of community projects that I'd worked on before. Love your sister. It was my, what do you call it? My, my backyard. Your uh, wheelhouse. My wheelhouse. That's what I was looking for. She came up with some of the best ideas. It probably wouldn't have succeeded without her. But it would not have worked with um, two people pulling the levers up the top. And was she comfortable with that? Never. No. Given that the charity was in her name, 
given that um, we were there to fulfil her mission, she was right to fill umbrage. I can't imagine the politics of it in terms of just it's a bit like a manager talent relationship, but also you know what? You're that's the, exactly what it yeah. was. I was her manager, but I can't work. But in some ways, you're the talent. No, she but was she's the talent. Also the talent. No, she was the talent because I spent two years grooming her. Okay, yeah. Connie, we can't have you being you out there. They're not going to want that. Okay, nobody wants a victim. Nobody wants a hard luck story. Nobody wants to hear how tough it is for you, Con. You're going to have to dump all that victim shit out there. Okay, you have to be stoic. You have to be happy to have cancer. Right, this is the only way we're going to sell this narrative. Connie's all about her. I had to turn her into a person that was all about other people. So she comes out as a mum that's, that's facing a terminal diagnosis and comes out and doesn't want any other young mum to go through that. But when you, you say know. it was all about her, it was all about her. She had the cancer. Uh, yeah, absolutely. But what she asked as her dying wish couldn't just be all about her. It had to be about a lot of other things. Did you fight much? No. No, we didn't. Why? Because, because it seems like you disagreed about a lot of things. Oh, yeah. but Did you but just let her fight. win because she had the cancer No, we card? didn't fight. We'd talk about it. Yeah, right. We, 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 I, we were I should have said, did you disagree? On nearly everything. Yeah. Yeah, on how to be as a human, on how to behave, on how to treat people. Yeah, absolutely. We, I disagreed with nearly every part of her um, across 40 years. We couldn't be more different. We couldn't be more diametrically opposed as people. And we couldn't have a, a more serious distaste for one another. We weren't each other's type. She didn't like me. She loved me. Mm. I didn't like her. I loved her. Put it this way, I'll tell you something. When I, I may have told you, I may have told you, I'm not sure, but when, I'm, when I was 21 and I broke on TV, she called me up, asked me for $6,000 for a couch. I told her to get fucked and that even if I had $2 million, I wouldn't give her $6,000 for a couch. And I told her how upset I was that now I had people in my family asking me for money now that I was on TV. I, I you know, gave her the don't argue. She hung up and rang Channel 9, Who Weekly, New Weekly, and offered to expose my drug habits. Um, uh, and that was a retaliation for me not lending her $6,000 for a couch. That's the sister I'm, I've been dealing with my whole life. How does a relationship ever recover from that kind of That's betrayal? That's normal relationship stuff. It's not betrayal. Uh, I don't know if most people call the media to... I think everybody works behind people's backs in various ways. You know, mm. we're all a bit duplicitous and uh, we've all, we're all running agendas. You know, she didn't do anything wrong. I just didn't like it much. I didn't do anything wrong. It just she didn't like it much. She didn't like you, the fact that you took drugs. Uh, no, no, no. She, she was had worried a, she, about well, you. Well, we lost our mum to an overdose. Yeah. Um, so how can you unscramble the part where she was judging you and yeah. the part where she loved you and didn't want to lose you? No, mm. no, no. That doesn't reconcile. You just felt judged. I don't think she was ever worried about losing me, no. Why would you say that? Why did you think she wasn't? Because I was never at risk. The day of the funeral, not the memorial service, but the funeral, you flew down to Melbourne and you were on the project that night and I watched you and I was very worried. I thought I was, I thought I was pretty, oh, the project that night of the funeral. Yeah. Yeah, right. Did, did I go into the desk, on the desk or? Or was it you just were on a, the desk. Was I? You insisted on coming in and being on the desk. You were out of your mind. Yeah, you know? yeah, right. You were out of your mind yeah. and you were talking about that you were going to vanquish cancer and all of this stuff. Oh, that's when I anointed myself head of cancer vanquishment. You did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Were you manic then? Were you just oh, must have been. driven yeah, by I grief? Did. Were you... Um, no, I, don't, I didn't see that as me unhinged. I saw that as pretty much me. Um, I don't you know, mean you were unhinged, but you seemed like there was so much going on. Well, I mean, inside you. Oh, I treat my job seriously, and I and I want, and and yeah, I don't really remember much. I just wanted to be. I I wanted to appoint myself the head of cancer vanquishment, and I wanted my new job title to be that um, 
that it was my responsibility. My job, my job description was to make sure that the cure doesn't come a day later than it ought. Mm-hmm. I realised that my job was no longer to raise money, and no, no longer to just raise ten million and throw piss in the ocean, but to make sure that we that we that, that the cure doesn't come later than it ought. And then from there, I went out to seek.com and I said, you employ me as head of cancer vanquishment in this country. Support me in doing this, you know. And they said no. Um, yeah, so I was pretty crazy. I was trying to go and get people to pay me to be head of cancer vanquishment in Australia. Yeah. How do you look back on that time now? Oh, typical. Yeah. What do you mean? Oh, it's just Sammy doing Sam. <laughs> you know. You're nothing if not passionate, my friend. I don't know whether it's passionate, but I'm enthusiastic. You were very enthusiastic. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, think to, to, I think to be passionate, you have to understand things well. I've seen a lot of... <laughs> you don't think you... Well, my enthusiasm gets in the way of my understanding, Mia. <laughs> you can be a little bit childlike in your idea well, of I'm how the world works. I'm an absolute infant. Yeah, totally. Yeah, but I think sometimes not knowing stuff gives you a level of confidence and determination that you probably wouldn't have if you actually knew how hard it was going to be. Yeah, yeah. Look, I mean, as part of my mania, you know, part of that's grandiose delusions. So I do get grandiose delusions. And part of the reason I feel I can go and unicycle around the country for 364 days is because I'm deluded enough to think that I can. That dream was born out of it from delusion. I'll become head of cancer vanquishment in this country and I'll actually, rather than raise money, I'm going to actually... I'm going to shrink the timeline. You know, I mean, that takes massive amounts of delusion. So that- so I use that blue sky area. Mm. I use those manic bursts. I use those delusions to create my life and my life are born from them. And without those, I don't have a dear Santa. I don't have a big heart project. I don't have a love your sister. I don't have $8.5 million in the bank. So, yeah, if you can harness your madness great things will come but you can only harness it by facing off with it if you if you do not acknowledge your madness and and work to understand it in the knowledge that it will know you better than you will ever know it uh, then you're just a, a raving lunatic as opposed to a, a crazy guy done good when you talk about your mania are you talking about a mental health type of mania or you, just you're using that as a euphemism for... I don't know what it is mental health-wise. I'm not on medication, so, you know, I'm... Uh, so. Have you ever been diagnosed with oh, mental yeah, illness? Yeah. What? I don't, I don't like the labels. Yeah. That's, you're not the first person who's yeah, heard that to um, me. I, Look, in, in my mum's day when my mum was mm. sick, they called it manic depression. Mm. So, yeah, my mum was chronically manic depressive, prone to extreme swings, and she killed herself when I was three. Uh, Connie had it, I had it, and Hilda's got it. Absolutely no questions asked. But we're in a world now that uh, is open about it, and I treat it now, and I've treated it for years. And initially, I, they put me on a medication that they give the epileptics just to keep my brain kind of smooth. And I stayed on that for six years while I got the therapy and while I did the work and while I got to understand myself. And a um, combination of doing the work, getting the therapy, taking the medication and growing older and more weary has kind of led me to a state of relative calm. I think uh, mental health is um, something that's harsher when you're younger. How do you treat it now? Uh, I treat it with mindfulness, self-awareness. There's a bunch of practical shit. It's boring. It's boring. I flag it when I'm going down and make sure I don't spiral too far and I make sure I try and eat well and I make sure I try and get some sleep and then I try and make sure I'm physically active because if I'm not moving, I'll get depressed and it's fucking boring. I hope you're also grateful. What's that? I hope you're also hashtag grateful. Grateful for what? That's really helpful. (laughs) Grateful. I'm permanently grateful. I'm not grateful grateful. at the fact that I have to fucking spend 50% of my time managing myself. Where do drugs and alcohol fit into it though? Usually between about 5 and 7 p.m. Sam. (laughs) Uh, What do you mean where do they fit in? Wherever I can afford to fit them in, for fuck's sake. I don't even know how to ask you about this. Like, I feel like I feel like I'm one of those people who want to give you soup and say, Sam, I don't want you to take drugs and I don't want you to drink. Fuck off with your soup. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just I'm just playing. Um, what was the question? I don't want you to take drugs. I don't take drugs much. 
much. What? All right. So you feel like I had two a V's on it. this morning. I've had two V's. V. What's a V? Oh, that like drink. Like the caffeine because yeah. I don't drink coffee. I've okay. had two joints and a little bit of a pot cookie before I came in, just so I can stay chill. And it's eleven a.m. Yeah, so I'm basically off all the drugs. You're basically sober. This Dude, is you sober. Fucking A. Thank you. Where's the respect? I've come a long way. In like, no, seriously, I'm a pothead, right? Right. And, and we know that that's not going to fuck you up too much if you, if you do it responsibly. I mean, plenty. Well, can we, some we, people. Look, it can cause awful drug psychosis, yeah. and I don't recommend it, but it can also kind of help balance this old wonky head out. I, I, I've, I've used it to self medicate for years, and, I, and, and I've achieved many things and a happy life on it. So, But not everyone does. And not everyone does, and I'm not trying to promote that. the weed. I what I'm it. saying is that I don't, I don't come down on myself for the weed. You were talking about that manic state you get into. Mm hmm. What does it feel like when you're in that manic state? Does it awesome. feel good or oh, does yeah. it feel a bit like edgy? Oh, it depends. It yeah. depends. So the manic high, the high bit where you are deluded and you're literally just bouncing. Because you believe you are going to vanquish cancer. No, you know you are. Uh, yeah, it's just a fact. No, you have to convince yourself of it, but you can eventually do that. Um, it's been hard work trying to convince myself that I can actually make a meaningful difference in this fight because there's a lot of what little old me but you already have no i haven't but you have you're wrong you're I'm you right. are absolutely wrong how can i'm not wrong you are it's completely wrong me wrong about a lot of things i'll but tell I'm not you wrong this right that. let me let We're me, have let me demonstrate your wrongness okay i'm gonna find disagreement mate god you're inflammatory i am <laughs> it's so tabloid i'm still gonna win go on Oh, it's about winning, is it? I thought it was about learning. I'm like, um, you have made a bloody difference. Um, no, I haven't. If I wasn't here, this country would spend exactly the same amount on medical research. Okay? There's 55,000 registered charities in this country. Many, many cancer mobs. Right? You take Love Your Sister out, that money will still go through to the scientists. Okay? I've made no tangible effect on the fight against cancer. Uh, I said tangible. No, I disagree. No, no. Also, explain tangible. Uh, I'm talking What's about. Your definition? Well, if you're going to tell me I've made a difference, yep. then making a difference in the fight against cancer mm -hmm. um, it involves a lot more than ten million dollars and a bit of awareness raising. Mia, depends it, how you you measure no, it. No, that before difference. you start arguing, listen to that, right? Because ten million dollars. And a bit of awareness raising could also be said to be a piss in the fucking ocean. Okay? Cancer treats our millions and our billions with scorn, with contempt, and 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 to cancer, I have made no difference. But okay? So don't sit there telling me that I've made a difference in my fight against cancer when cancer doesn't even know my name. The people Not who yet. have cancer know your name. Yeah, yeah. And, and you've they, made a difference to them. Don't yeah, argue me on that. I'm trying to make a difference. I understand, I'm trying but to there are different ways to make a difference, Sam. And love your sister. Make a difference. It's, it's weird. Don't use those words. Well, I'm gonna, don't tell me what use the words I no, can use. No, I don't use. like them. I'm banning them. The, commu the community you've built around <laughs> love your sister, the yeah. Facebook group. Well, that's meaningful. That's Thank made you. a oh, difference. Oh, okay. Yeah, absolutely. So who's made a difference? Absolutely. You well, in the, in the fight against cancer, no. In the galvanising and bringing together of a large community in Australia based on connection, humanity, kindness, goodwill, absolutely I've made a difference. Support. Absolutely I've made a difference. Feeling seen. Yeah. Quitting smoking, losing weight, you know, finding friends when you had yeah. none. I'm bringing people together in that sense. I help connect people. I'm a, I'm a facilitator. So my, my work as a facilitator has made a small difference, but my work as a cancer fundraiser has not. So I'm glad that we can make the, uh, the distinction. Yeah, it comes down to how you how you, you agree define. with me. You agree and with you me. agree you with me, so I think everyone wins. Sure. And so does cancer because it hasn't been cured yet. <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, we wouldn't want to all be out of a job, would we? So where have you got with the vanquishment? Um, well, I had me some delusions, some big time fucking delusions. I mean, I um, I've spent a year in La La Land since Connie died. I haven't been on the drugs. Don't, don't, don't think that I've just been, I haven't been. I'm really, really good now. Um, just because I went hard after the funeral doesn't mean that that's the picture. The whole you look time. well. You didn't look well after she died. No, and I wasn't. Mm. But I've been trying to wrap my head 
around actually trying to make a difference with the cancer thing. And I'm like, because my sister delivered me a rebuke from the grave. Two days after she died, she delivered me a stunning $66 million fuck you from the grave. And... How so? Oh, man. Four years ago, she rang me up and um, Tony Abbott was in power. He was spruiking a thing called the Medical Research Future Fund. He wanted a $20 billion fund to fight cancer and he wanted to fund it with a $6 GP co-payment so that every time you went to the doctor, you paid six bucks and it went into this fund. Four years ago, my sister rings me and says, have you heard of the MRFF? And I went, yeah, what of it? What is it? The Medical oh, Research yep, Future sorry, Fund. Yep. I didn't like it, along with the rest of the country and along with the media. It wasn't means tested. It, it hit our people the hardest. Our people are mums, 85% mums, 85% broke and can't afford this stuff. It wasn't means tested. The poor, the elderly, the sick, the infirm were the ones that were going to bear the burden of paying for yeah. this fund. And to me, to support the fund was misrepresenting the people um, that I represented. Love your sister. Connie saw it differently. Connie said to me, look, we should all want to pay. They want us to support this legislation. Can love your sister get behind the Medical Research Future Fund? I tore a new one. I said, fucking hell, Connie. You, first you want me to raise a million dollars, then you want me to remind every young mum in the land to be breast aware. We're an awareness raising initiative. We're a fundraising initiative. Now you want me to get political? Now you want me to undermine? You want me to split in half our base, which I've spent three or four years building? You want me to land one Facebook post in there that's political and cut them in half and divide them? We're about being together on this, Connie. What part of... what? You're fucked, mate. Like, this hanging out with all these people in Canberra has gotten to your head on no day of the fucking week. No way. Fucking over my dead body. And um, she let me finish. And she said, and this has come back in my head over and over again, and I can say it the way she said it because I'm a voiceover guy. I'll give you the exact tone of it. She went, so I imagine I've just barreled her for ten minutes and mm. gone over my dead body. She went, but can I still work on it? But can I still work on it? It goes around in my head. I went, yeah, as long as no one knows. Two days after she died, you wonder why I was fucked up. I open up the paper. There's no bit for Connie with my favourite photo of me and her in the middle of it, which just sent me sideways. I looked to see who wrote it. Professor Tony Cunningham, the head of the Australian Association of Medical Research Institutes, the CEO of the Peter McCallum Cancer Research Institute, CEO of Walter and Eliza Hall Cancer Research Institute, CEO of bloody Garvin, the, all of the, the creme de la creme of the Australian scientific research community got together to write my sister's obit and fuck me if it wasn't all about the bloody Medical Research Future Fund. She campaigned behind my back on it. She rolled herself through Parliament in extreme pain, at Actively dying, begging them, pleading them, imploring them to support this legislation. Every single member of parliament, she got to them all. And it was the contention of Professor Tony Cunningham in this article that if my sister didn't put a face to the problem, that that legislation wouldn't have passed. And that the first $66 million interest payment from that fund, which was released the week she died, should be made in her name. So while I'm... Ground level, town to town, shaking tens, trying to get to that 10 million, just thinking it's piss in the ocean. We're just, we're not making a difference. We're not here to. We're just doing the right thing, get it ticking along. So while I'm doing that, she gives me a $66 million fuck you from the grave two days after she died. And I'm like, fuck, I've missed the point. I didn't realise we were here to solve cancer. I thought we were just here to connect and lose weight and quit smoking and find friends because that was the reason I was doing it. And she's like, no, nah, buddy. Don't forget about the main game, Buster. We're here to cure it, okay? And this $66 million will get you started now I'm gone. Have a think, little brother. Have a think of what you're doing with my organisation. 
You reckon you can call yourself custodian of my legacy when you don't even know what my legacy is? You read that article in the paper. Those people know what my legacy is. You take your name off the list. So I went on the project. I'm like, I'm custodian of Connie's legacy. I'm head of cancer vanquishment. It's my job to make sure the cure doesn't come a day. Making sense now? Mm. So then I spend a year just going, fuck, my job is actually to cure cancer. I can't cure cancer. I'm just a little fucking fuck up that can't even fucking keep his grandiose delusions in check. I'm. What do you mean I've got to fucking solve cancer now? I just wanted to get to 10 million. We were never meant to solve cancer. No one told me that. And so I was like, I have to do this if I want to be custodian of her legacy. And I want to be that. I want to, I want that title. I set out to do that since seven years ago. I still want to. If I want to, if I want to reclaim my title as, as, as chief custodian of my sister's legacy and head of cancer vanquishment in this country, I've got to do more than raise 10 million. I can't do that. I'm not that guy. Why would it be me? So for a year, for the year since she died, I've been trying to work out what to do. And eventually, after a couple of months, I was like, well, I don't know. I don't have the answers. How the fuck would I know? I'm a retired unicyclist, a glorified fucking tin rattler, a fucking bullshit actor that got way too much kudos the fuck I don't know how but someone will know so hang on someone will know I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel this shit's been done Sam Bill and Melinda Gates cured polio have a look over there go back to your inspiration Sam have a look there look at Fred Nile look at that that's legacy he's, he's, he's curing people from their blindness from the grave not Fred Nile Fred Hollows Fred Hollows Sorry, Fred Hollows, I always get him uh, mixed up. Very bad. Though. Fred, uh, Fred Hollows. Fred, uh, Fred Hollows. He's still curing people yeah. of blindness. And he's dead, isn't he? He is. Is he dead? Mm. Um, and then I looked at Steve Irwin, my hero, my number one hero of all time. And I looked at what he did. And then I looked at, I looked everywhere. And I, and I ended up, after six months of looking everywhere, I ended up in 1750 something in England um, there's poor people that had to make the Oxford Dictionary there was no dictionary for the English language there was a huge in the 1700s there was a huge demand for our language to be annotated there was no proper record of it and there was huge the public were clamoring for it it was too big a job everybody thought it was too much a guy called Samuel Johnson wrote the first um, supposed comprehensive dictionary in 1730 or 1740, but it was shit. It was done by one man. There was a guy in England that realised that it could be done. It's just the whole country had to do it. Right? Mm -hmm. So he told the country, he said, country, we need an English dictionary. We can't write it on our own, even if we get all the universities together. We need you to write it for us. Submit your words from A to AD from in this year. Mm. So submit AD to AF in that year. Wow. Over the next 55 years, the country crowdsourced the Oxford Dictionary before the internet. So I was there going, fuck, righto. So if you get everyone on board, you can change shit. And I thought, that crowdsourcing model for the Oxford Dictionary... I could go around for the rest of my life and tell the country that we need this dictionary to be written. So what does that look like? Oh, you'll find out next year once I've built it proper. Mm -hmm. but, um, but no, you just clickbaited me. I think it's, um, it's, I think I'm going to call it the fuck cancer bank. And I think it's, I, th I, think, I think we can change the way we treat this problem. We're all throwing our money in the wrong directions and too many directions. If we got together on this, we could really make a difference. Um, so I've decided to try and do a Fred Hollows and try and give Connie that legacy that she wanted. 
And I've realised it's not about getting to 10 million, it's about making sure mums don't die of this fucking thing. And maybe, just maybe, I do have a plan. I went and asked people, I didn't say what, what's wrong, you know, where are we going wrong? I said, I said, imagine that I've got a magic, a magic, um, what do you call those things, the genie things? Oh yeah, like a, I said, that you get three wishes. Um, yeah, imagine yeah. that I've got a magic crystal ball. Yeah. And that I can give you whatever you want. Just imagine that I can do that. Everything you want. What do you want? And I went and asked the scientific community, research community, not-for-profit community, governments, big business. I asked everyone, what are we, what? If you had three wishes and I could, and I could pull the trigger, what would you do? And their answers told me what the problem was. And once mm. I knew what the problem was, I was able to build a system around it. So, and the system, I'm not reinventing the wheel, it's been done before, but the Bill and Melinda Gates model and the MRAAF are great examples of, of how you can uh, build up to that critical mass of money where you've got so much money making money that you can solve it. I'm telling you right now, 10 million is not going to do it, but if you've got 100 billion in a fund and, and, you, and you're using the interest to reinvest in the fund and to... Uh, and to pay for more research. The thing is, the NHMRC, which which distributes eight hundred million dollars worth of research funding a year, about four hundred million to cancer, give or take, is now supported by the MRWF, which um, which is an eight billion dollar fund. Um, but neither of those are specific cancer funds. They all help all medical research. Mm. Um, I'd like to create a fund that's cancer only, that serves as a dream catcher, because only about 13% of funding applications are, are, are approved financially. We don't. We support the same six 55-year-old blokes, mm. and they're white. Women in science aren't getting a run. The money's not there. Um, the left of field ideas that often lead to breakthroughs, we don't have money for them either. So I'm kind of keen to create a fund that exists to support all of science. Not just the old 55-year-old men who have... Because the NHMRC isn't wrong. It needs to be merit-based. They haven't made a mistake. It's just that after doing it for that long, it has created mm. entrenched, institutionalised problems that we need to solve. Now, rather than go back into that world and try and fix it, because you cannot reverse engineer a fix on that stuff, I'd like to start afresh. And I'd like to start with a fund that is progressive, modern, allows for women in science, allows for left of field stuff, allows for renegades. And if you don't get your funding from the NHMRC, and if you don't get your funding from the MRWF, well, bloody well, come to us. So I'm going to spend the rest of my life going around you know, speaking to every human I can possibly lay my hands on to, say, to ask them whether they want to change the way we treat this and to see whether they want to become a depositor or a a dollar a week into my fuck cancer bank because if we get the numbers right we can do this in a way that nobody feels a dollar a week sounds eminently reasonable to me you don't feel it no you just don't mo some people do and i'm not yeah. asking for a dollar off them mm. i'm not asking for a dollar off them i'm not even asking for them to put a dollar in my tin i'm sick of asking people most affected by this disease to pay for it i am sick of it enough i've done a deal with the department of housing and Queensland and I, I'm going to see women that can't afford to rock up to my fundraisers that aren't in the echo chamber you know I can't I've got to be careful not get not to get sucked into the vortex and preach to the converted so you wrote a book no nah, I didn't I didn't write one I wrote a letter and you it's came in, up and with it's a, in a book idea for a book no I didn't I ripped it off someone else and claimed it as my own it was actually Des the master of technical impossibilities at my work He's uh, our tech guy. Um, we run a quarterly. And it's my it's my version of the big issue. I the think, stick. Yeah, it's called the, the stick. It's my it's stick. my attempt at a big issue type thing. The whole cover price goes to cancer research, and um, he suggested that our ep episode six, our episode sixmas, uh, be a collection of letters to Santa um, in our little journal that no one reads. Um, I read it. It's brilliant. Everyone in here yeah, loves it. Okay, you're one of three. Yeah, we've got about 2,000 subscribers. It's, it's, it's spluttering and we'll die soon. But um, I decided that a letter, uh, the idea, the concept of letters to Santa from adults is really funny uh, because we've got a lot of unresolved issues and stuff. So, so I pitched it. I rang my publisher and pitched it to them. And I was like, what do you think of this Dear Santa idea? I'll get a whole bunch of famous Aussies and they can write letters to Santa. 
And I'm like, that sounds great. How many have you got? Because they knew that I was running it in my journal. I said, oh, I've got heaps. There are heaps. Yeah. It was like, and they were like, how good are they? And I'm like, you'll have more famous people than you can poke a stick out. Whatever you're imagining. It'll in be terms better. of the famous the amount of famous people we're going to have in it, no it's going no to be way it's going to be way better than that. And they rang back the next day and commissioned it, and I said, "How long till print deadline?" And they were like, two weeks. We're going for it this Christmas." And I was like, "Oh fuck!" Better send out some emails then. Better ring me. Uh. <laughs> You're in it. It was funny because I got your email, um, and you and got I was back like, to me. I'm sorry, I didn't get back to your other one. What? I, you, you get back to my emails. I'm fuck. Get back to you three months later. When yeah, it's no, too I don't. Late. Ex- I'm sorry. I don't expect much from you, but you shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> I expect I, heaps from you're you. You're a chronic you underachiever. You are. <laughs> um, but it just you, as soon I thought, oh, that's a bit of a weird concept, and then it just yeah. came out straight away. Yeah. And tell me about some of your favourite letters in here. Um, can I read my favourite? It's really quick. It's really quick. Um, I've, I, look, my favourites change. To be honest. Um, here we go. Let me find it. Uh, where is he? What's his name? <laughs> I got my hopeless. Ah, here we go. This is by Graham Connors. I'll tell you who he is after I read the letter. Okay. Dear Santa, please soften the hearts of the hard men. Help them revisit the innocence of childhood and undo the damage they have done. Oh. Graham Connors. He wrote for Slim Dusty. Wow. Yeah. I want yeah. you to read yours now. <laughs> Are you read joking? Yours. No, I'm not joking. Oh, I'll, well, I'll do an excerpt. You're a voiceover guy. I'll do an excerpt. Read some of it at I'll least. Read, yeah, I'll read some. Uh, what page am I on? 30, 30, 34. <laughs> Mine's not very respectful. I fucked up on mine. I never knew it'd be published. <laughs> I really didn't. I just wrote it as a private exercise for fun to see whether this guy's concept was any good. And then two weeks later, I'm going to print and I haven't had a chance to change it. (laughs) Go on. Santa, you're fat. Since you started giving people what they want, they have also become fat. Coincidence? I suggest not. You also teach that if we behave well for others, we'll get what we want as a reward. You've turned virtue into a door prize. People expect a return on goodness now, which is quite sad to say the least. That's on you. You endanger deformed reindeer whose noses clearly need looking after. Their bulbous noses are proof uh, proof of mistreatment and it's heinous. There's a lot of stuff I'm not going to read on out here because it's too filthy. Don't even get me started on your carols or the promiscuity under the mistletoe you openly promote. All those chimneys you thrust yourself down without permission. Hope you meet with a bloody partridge in a pear tree one day and I can see how you fucking like it. No, no, no. Not a Merry Christmas. I'd rather accelerate myself into the holiday road toll than keep up with your piss week antics. Go fuck yourself. From a very naughty boy, because of you probably, Sam. I'm going to read mine. For Please a... do. Dear Santa, I'm really sorry my dog bit you. Again. As I mentioned in my apology letter last year, her name is Bella and she's a rescue dog. And for reasons we don't completely understand, she has some issues with men. And people wearing hats. And people with facial hair. Also sunglasses. Basically, if you have anything on or around your face, she will lose her shit. It's not her fault. Since the unfortunate incident last year when you shed quite a lot of blood in and around the fireplace, presumably at the location of your entrance to deliver presents, we consulted with a dog trainer or a whisperer, as everyone who knows anything about anything or perhaps just downloaded a PDF from the internet is now called. His name was Graham, and Graham told us that we needed to stop making excuses for whatever past she may have had before coming to us, and that she was just being unreasonable with the biting. And that some dogs are just nuts. He believes she's one of those dogs. I floated my theory with Graham that perhaps she just has highly attuned facial recognition software installed in her brain, and any perceived alteration to the facial area in the form of hats, sunglasses, facial hair, or a new fringe caused the software to malfunction to the point where she no longer recognised the face and decided to bite whatever body part was closest to the ground. Graham said that was bullshit. So anyway, once again, please accept my sincere apologies and I do hope that the delicious quinoa muffins, gluten-free, that I left out for you to snack on help to dull the pain. On the bright side, your suit is great camouflage for blood. So there's that. (laughs) And it was a great strategy to leave the reindeer on the roof because last week Bella ate a possum. 
All the very best. And this year we will for sure try to remember to tie Bella up far away from the Christmas tree. <laughs> love, Mia. I love yours. It's really cute. It's um, also I'm, really true. Oh, uh, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> she would bite the shit out of any yeah, sounder looking yeah. person that came near my Mine house. Mine was also really true as well. I don't know. I don't feel like many people died, although there was a broadcaster in Melbourne that was very cynical about our efforts. It was just like every celebrity is full of it, <laughs> coming in with their bloody sanctimonious fucking earnest stuff. Nobody asked for a million dollars. Nobody mm. asked for a $500,000 bright blue Aston Martin. You know, it's um, why aren't people being honest about the fact that they still want stuff? Didn't even occur to me to ask for anything. I just apologise. That's my just, I didn't. Yeah, right. My that's default telling. position that's is so just telling. cowering and asking yeah, yeah. for forgiveness. Yeah, 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 to the big man. You know, <laughs> um, but I, I didn't ask for anything either. I just asked for the chance to bloody vent. A lot of people ask for the vanquishment of cancer. Oh, Lee Sales did it yeah. most uh, most deftly. She did. Um, let me paraphrase. Um, uh, while you're at it, Santa, maybe maybe you could give us a cure for cancer. That way, next year I can ask for a Prada handbag with complete impunity. <laughs> <laughs> She's a class act. Ah, uh, she is, isn't she? She really is. Um, she, uh, I, I don't like putting anyone in 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 the same bags, but for me, you know, your Mia's, your Lee Sales, your Natasha Stott Despoyers. These are all these are all women that I personally like uh, and, uh, and admire um, and or look up to. I don't want to be too effusive, but yeah, I mean, these are the women that have informed my life. Um, whether it be you, Lee, Natasha, when I was younger, it was Natasha. You kind of, in a way, because I was starting to try and be entrepreneurial as well myself in my life at the time when you were basically just becoming the startup queen. I kind of, I think I'd, I, I had Natasha and then I had you because it reflected my change because I was a startup charity and I did a lot. I, I see myself as um, a, what do you call it? A, um, in um, a, What do you call it when you do something the way someone else, like I see myself as a... Um, Acolyte? Yeah. That's probably not yeah, the right word. I don't know. I don't know what that means. Um, but in terms of kind of, I, I did a lot of shit that I saw you doing. Um, yeah. So when I say admire, it's, it's, I admire it enough to appropriate it. Please do. <laughs> I know you're an appropriator. No, I, I am, yeah. I love you, Sammy. <laughs> I love you too, darling. Thanks for putting up with naughty, filthy Sammy today. I've just, I don't know, I just after all this fucking mainstream media, I just obviously felt I had to rock the boat for no reason whatsoever. I just love all the parts of you, even mm. the manic crazy ones. Just try and love the good parts, please, like I do. You don't want to love the bad bits. See ya. Thank you for listening to No Filter. You can buy Dear Santa at any good bookstore or at apple.co forward slash Mamma Mia. Please do so. All the proceeds go to helping Sam to vanquish cancer. And if you want more Sam in your ears, why not check out the other two interviews with Sam that I've done over the last couple of years. Search for The Secret Life of Samuel Johnson and Samuel Johnson is okay in your podcast feeds. No Filter is produced by Liza Ratliff. I'm Mia Friedman and I'll see you on Mamma Mia.